Coleman Federal Correctional Complex, Southside Orlando, Florida. Home to drug traffickers, mafia dons, and up until one year ago, prisoner number 18330424, aka Conrad Black. Canada's best known media baron, one time owner of the London Telegraph, the Jerusalem Post, and here at home, the National Post. A daily newspaper that provided an alternative conservative voice and energized the competition. Together with his wife, journalist Barbara Emile, Conrad was a high flyer. Homes in London, New York, Toronto, and Palm Beach, a couple of private jets, a seat in Britain's House of Lords. He rubbed shoulders with the rich and powerful, but then the crash. For years, Conrad Black lived large on millions of shareholder dollars. Charges that he fleeced his own company, Hollinger International, charges he continues to deny. This has been one massive smear job for me to say. In all, Conrad served just over three years for fraud and obstruction of justice. He used the time well, though, tutored inmates and researched his new book, a strategic history of the United States called Flight of the Eagle. How are things? Fabulous. <laughs> that good? Yeah, excellent, thanks. Yeah, very What's nice. What's the difference between a strategic history and a history of? Well, we're speaking of a country. So the history of the country, you'd have uh, cultural facts, you'd have uh, um, more detail on demographic trends, growth of individual cities, internal matters, the correlation of forces between different states. I don't have any of that. I'm just dealing with uh, the strength of the country, the political developments, the economic strength, and the military strategic policy. When, when did you decide that this was the next book? Uh, I, that's a good question. I was writing, uh, I mean, it's pr probably of no interest to anyone but me, but I find it a good question. But I was, I was, I w I was teaching history in my... Uh, to my uh, students when I was in the guest house of the American government. And, uh, are, are your students other inmates? Is that what you're saying? They were, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, they were. Uh, and, though some of them were knowledgeable historically. For example, we had the former treasurer of the Republican Party of Ohio and an advanced man for... Uh, it's almost like a sitcom, except uh, for the part where it's not funny. It, well, well, aspects of it were extremely amusing. There's no doubt of that. They'd be better than most sitcoms I've seen. But <laughs> as you say, other aspects were not quite so funny. And the fact that I was there at all was an outrage. But that, that's neither here nor there. But uh, it just seemed to me... And, and this is following upon biographies I wrote of President Roosevelt and President Nixon, that, of course, there's a vast literature on American history, and much of it's very good. And I don't, I don't ever believe in trying to write things that have already been written. Uh, if, if it's already been done and you can't do it better, don't do it. But it seemed to me uh, that the extreme importance of underestimated, undernoted acts taken and strung together throughout American history could be made into an interesting book. Did you find it was your one way of sticking it back to the American people for putting you in jail, that you were like, you know, I'm going to write a book about you while in here? No, no and it's a pro-American book. Uh, no, I'll tell you what was a bit of what you just said in reference to the prison system, was that all of my students were people that were sent to me when they, when they couldn't pass the routine course. And... Uh, and the reason they couldn't pass wasn't that they weren't intelligent enough. It was that they were not motivated. They thought it was just another sleazy trick of this corrupt regime that had sent them there in the first place and over-sentenced them, or in many cases found them guilty wrongfully. And they were not going to cooperate with this awful system. Some might have thought you might be part of the upper class. You're the guy with the money and uh, oh, the power. Oh, they didn't care about that. I mean, they thought the... They thought the, the Don, the Don we had, I mean, the Mafia Don we had there, he was the upper class. Oh, I was just some yeah, foreigner. They didn't, they didn't relate to that at all. <laughs> some foreigner? Yeah. What was your, like, let's just play a clip for me. I don't want to play the, 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 the two guys having a sword, sword fight, but play the Paxman clip for just a second here. One of Codran's answers. 99.5% of prosecutions in the U.S. are convicted. The whole system is a fraudulent, fascistic conveyor belt to their corrupt prison system. That's why. Let me tell you something. The 5% of the population of the world are Americans. 25% of the incarcerated people are, and 50% of the lawyers are. 99.5% conviction rate. This sits very Six odd. to 12 times as many incarcerated people per capita as Britain, Canada, Australia, France, Germany, or Japan. How do you explain that? 
That, that interview turned into an unbelievable, and pardon my, pardon my, but it was a gigantic <laughs> swinging contest. <laughs> and it was a fight. But not, I wonder. Not as far as I was concerned. <laughs> <laughs> why do you. Why do you do that? You, when you do those British shows, it's a fight most of the time. No, 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 no. no, no, no I, I watch no, their no. fights. A lot of them, they're come after I you. I was on television five times a day for eight days in a row. Uh, it just two became as argumentative as that. And by the way, the British loved that. This theory over here in genteel, gullible Canada that I'd somehow besmirched myself by being so aggressive in my responses to these guys is complete bunk. For, for three days, I couldn't get a taxi driver to, to, to turn his, you know, to put his uh, thing on, to run up the fare, to put his meter on. He wouldn't do it. He said, look, for the first guy said, for 15 years, I've been waiting for someone to stick it to Paxman, and you finally did it. <laughs> but for, yeah, yeah, I think, but there's this when, when he didn't put his meter on, I thought, oh, God, here we got it. Here's another one of these, you know, sleazy London cab drivers who thinks he's got some nincompoop from... Portland, Oregon or something is going to charge me 50 pounds to go four blocks, you see? And I said, you know, your meter's not on. And then he explained, no, big, I, I, I would never charge anyone who talked to Paxman like I that. I think because some people feel like you're a man who's benefited greatly from the system, that when the system convicted you, you refused to acknowledge it as a conviction. Like you, that, I think that's what some people feel. Don't give me that look. George, it ain't going to work uh, on me. George, uh, Don't look at no, no. I, I, I'm not responsible for, for how other people feel. And I'm certainly not responsible for that kind of reasoning. I no more committed crimes than anyone in this room. The chance of my committing those crimes are less than zero. And as far as I'm concerned, I won my battle with that evil system that grinds 99% of people to powder and extracts confessions of guilt in almost Stalinist fashion from all kinds of people who aren't guilty. So what will you do now? Will you, will you, lock, will you try to change the system? I, no, I'm not an American. It's not my problem. I, look, uh, uh, good luck to them. Well, no, Nobody no. is safe in that country. <laughs> We're going more with Conrad Black after this. who are a part of what we call the 21st century abolition movement want to see the issues that prisons attempt to address but cannot. Justice that's not based on vengeance, but justice that's made on repairing the relationships that are uh, damaged uh, uh, through uh, harm. What do you think of that? Wait, was that the <laughs> Angela Davis from yeah. California? Yeah, yeah. You mean, who, who was a fugitive from justice in the late 60s? Yeah. My God, I hadn't seen her all those years. Yeah. Oh. She was a, she was a, Quite a flamboyant personality in those days. Yeah. Well, well, I about, like, uh, look, I, when she says, um, no, I agree, no vengeance, but, uh, but uh, this gets delicate. I mean, in theory, there's a punitive aspect to these things. And, and that isn't always bad, as long as, as, long as the punishment aspect is uh, sensibly proportionate. Fundamentally, she's right. It is the wrong approach. Now, I don't think we can just kill them with kindness, but confining people for things like driving a truck with marijuana in it, yeah. especially as they do it in the United States for 20 years, is just nonsense. Like paying these, uh, you know, paying unskilled laborers, correctional officers, uh, you know, eighty or ninety thousand dollars a year to strut around and say abusive things to these people, and having prisoners cost sixty thousand dollars a year just to be denied any possibility to renovate their personalities or add a cubit to their stature, either psychologically or intellectually. This is no way. It's just, it's just done because it's always been done, George. We've had prisons for thousands of years. Well, prisons no, are the business, what we right? need is some zero-based thinking. They're a complete waste of time. They're nonsense. I mean, it didn't bother me. I mean, I had I built up four million readers in these columns I write in the U.S. and elsewhere in Canada. Um, uh, uh, on the email, you know, and I psychologically didn't live in the place. I had visitors every day. I had legal visits every day. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, it was a bloody nuisance, certainly, and I didn't enjoy it, but, uh, but it didn't bother me as much as most people. But uh, you see these people come in with no means. Uh, they've, as you said at the outset, they've had a terribly short shrift all the way around. 
uh, they were they were sandbagged in their legal proceedings, over sentenced or or found guilty either despite being innocent or on laws that shouldn't exist and are utterly ridiculous. And they're completely disillusioned, they're confused, there's no one to help them, there's no attempt to help them, and all they get are imperious, unskilled labor strutting about in uniforms with federal officer in the back telling them what to do, Selling usually it. telling them to do stupid things in an annoying way. Now, he's, he's, what kind of treatment is that? You sound what like are we a, doing it for? You sound like a hippie. You sound like a hippie, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> I, don't, no, I, don't, I don't think hippies speak in sentences, well, do they? No, they do. <laughs> Now you sound like the Lord. I say this with no glibness to people who are watching us who are incarcerated at this moment, but did you develop it again at least assign one prison nickname? Um, my students called me absolute rubbish because that was my answer to most questions. <laughs> <laughs> book is called Flight of the Eagle, a strategic history of the United States. There it is right there. Conrad Black, we'll be right back.